Hey guys, this is Nick and welcome to my Linux experiment. There are many ways to install packages on Linux to install applications and software. And some of these are misunderstood, some of these are not that well known, and some of these have preconceived notions attached to them. Since it is such a complex world to navigate, I think it's time we take a look at the various Linux packaging distribution formats and the main differences between them. So let's start right after this. This video is sponsored by Linode, the largest independent cloud computing provider. Linode makes it easy to create your own secure personal space on the internet. Just about everyone needs a website these days, but if, like me, you've used simple drag and drop website providers, you know they tend to lack customization, lock your website onto their platform, tend to be pretty slow and charge extra for basic features. Linode makes it as easy as possible for you to deploy enterprise-grade WordPress, Drupal or even static websites in just seconds with their one-click apps. These apps basically give you the same tools that businesses use and allow you to truly own your content, make websites that are ultra-portable and ensure you only pay for what you need. So level up, start building your website, your projects or personal blog on a platform you can trust with Linode. Sign up today and get $20 in credit on your new Linode account using the link in the description. Ok, so let's start with the good old packages. There are two main formats here, there are the DEBs and the RPMs. The DEBs are the Debian packaging format, they're mainly used on Debian, Ubuntu and any of those derivatives. Then there's the RPM used by Red Hat, Fedora, OpenSUSE and their derivatives as well. Now these packages contain a binary version of the app, there is no code source in the package itself most of the time, it's just a pre-compiled version of the application. It is compiled depending on your system architecture, which can be ARM-based, x86-based, or even another architecture like RISC, for example. Uh, this also means that it's pre-compiled for your system for 32-bit or 64-bit, and this explains why the installation of these packages can be usually pretty speedy, because there is nothing to compile, you just basically unpack the package and put the files where they are supposed to go. These packages are often pulled from repositories, uh, which means that you have a one-stop shop for all the packages available for your distro. Now all these packaging formats, devs and RPMs come with a descriptor file inside the package, which lets your system know which libraries it needs, because these packages don't package the whole library and application, they only package the application and they tell the system what libraries and dependencies they need to run. These dependencies are then fetched at install by your system from its available repositories and are installed if they are available. This is why you should always get the package version for your distribution specifically. If there is a package made for Debian and a package made for Ubuntu, if you're using Ubuntu, grab the package made for Ubuntu, because the libraries might not have the exact same name in the repos, they might not be the exact same version, and as such, your installation might fail. These devs and RPM packages have plenty of advantages. They are fast, because they are pre-compiled, they can be pulled from the repositories, they are really space efficient since they only install what they need and then they fetch the system's libraries to install and don't reinstall a copy of the same library 10 times on your system, but they also have some problems. The first one is the dependency issue. Each package needs to be compiled for a specific version of the distro, because that distro will ship with a specific version of its libraries. The developer needs to package its application for various distributions, various versions of the same distributions, and it can be pretty time consuming and not that easy to do. Now the second issue is that developers need to have some place to host all of these packages for the various architectures, for the various distributions, for the various versions of each distribution. So basically they need to set up a repo. They can ask the distribution to package their software inside their own repositories, but it can take a very long time, it's not that easy to do, and some packages will never get accepted for no well-explained reason. So basically you need to set up your own repository and put the burden on the user to add this repo and work it himself out how he needs to install the package. To fix most of these problems, the Flatpak format was created. Flatpak is a binary format as well, no source code here, is the binary version of the application so it's also pre-compiled. But Flatpaks have an advantage, they ship with their own subset of libraries, which means that you don't need to rely on the system's libraries to run. How is that an advantage? Well, the Flatpak can pull any version of any libraries that it needs. So if your system ships with a version that the Flatpak cannot make use of because it's too old or too recent, the Flatpak doesn't care because it can just ship the version it needs. Now to avoid shipping giant files, Flatpak applications can also reference various runtimes. For example, an application depending on GTK or the GNOME runtime doesn't have to ship the whole libraries and the whole GNOME stack. They can just reference a specific version of the GNOME or GTK runtime and various applications shipped as Flatpaks can reference different versions of these stacks, 
So on your system, you could have the GDK and GNOME stack for 3.32, 3.34, 3.36 for various apps that make use of these various versions of the libraries. Flatpaks are also relatively quick to install thanks to being binary, so you basically just copy paste the files where they need to go, and they reference various runtimes so they're not too big and stay pretty much space efficient even though they are less so than regular old packages. They are also installed from uh, repositories, which are called remotes in this case, with the better known remote being Flathub, where you can find almost all, if not absolutely all, of the applications available as Flatpaks. Now Flatpaks solve the dependencies issue, which means that if you want to install a relatively recent application on an older distribution that might not have the required libraries, well Flatpak doesn't care. It just ships the right version of the libraries on your system and they don't mess around with your system's libraries. So the application is basically self-contained and doesn't mess around with the rest of your stuff. Now Flatpaks also introduce some issues, the main one being security. Flatpaks are sandbox, which means that they cannot access everything they want on your system. But since the developer specifies which versions of the libraries they want to ship with their Flatpak, they can ship outdated and flawed versions that have security vulnerabilities in them. And it's the developer's job to patch them, or at least to update the various libraries that they use. If they don't, you're using an app with a vulnerability inside, which is mitigated by the fact that the application is sandboxed, but it's not ideal and not perfect. Flatpaks also do tend to use a little bit more disk space compared to Debian packages or RPMs since they ship versions of libraries that can be duplicated between various Flatpaks. So the more Flatpaks you install, the more duplicates you are installing on your system, even though you can't really see that. This is not getting to be a big problem these days since hard disk space is kind of cheap and not really an issue. And now we move on to snaps. Snaps are basically the same style of format than Flatpaks, which means they are binaries, they are self-contained with all their libraries included in them, and they are also pre-compiled, and they are shipped through a single remote. But that's one of the differences that we'll see later. Snaps can also make use of runtimes to avoid shipping all the libraries all the time. Snaps do have an interesting difference though. They can ship server-side stuff. Flatpaks generally focus on graphical applications, but Snaps can ship command line level stuff. For example, by running a single command, like for example snap install nextcloud, you can install a whole nextcloud server with all the backend needed, all the configuration pre-made, in just one command line. That is pretty efficient and a big advantage of snaps compared to flatpaks. Another difference of snaps is the fact that they can do delta updates. This means that your application, when it needs to update, can pull just the bits that have changed since the last version you installed, instead of re-downloading the whole application. This makes update sizes a lot smaller and a lot quicker. And these updates can be applied while the snap is still running. As long as the snap is running, it's going to run on the current version you're using and it can be updated in the background. If you close the snap and reopen it, then it's going to be the updated version. And if this one doesn't fit or doesn't work for you, you can revert to the older version super easily, which is something that is a lot harder to do with flatpaks and regular applications packaged as devs or RPMs, since your configuration files will be erased and replaced by the ones using the newer versions, which might introduce some incompatibilities. Snaps do have some problems though. The first one is that it doesn't support your main desktop theme. They try to match your desktop theme by using a specific uh, snap shipping a lot of often used themes, but if it doesn't find the theme that you're using in that repository, then it's going to default to a default theme. And this means that your snaps might look very out of place on your desktop if you're using a custom theme. The second problem is that snaps can't make use of third-party repositories. All the snaps are only available through Snapcraft or the Snap Store, which is a single repo where you can pull all the snaps. This repo is controlled entirely by Canonical and they decide what goes in and what doesn't, which means that it's not really open and it's not really community-based, which can be an issue for some people. Snaps also tend to be bigger and have longer launch times than Flatpaks or regular dev packages. This is a problem as well, they've been working on it, but as of now, waiting 5 or 6 seconds to open a standard application that's not particularly heavy is a big deal. While all package-based distributions have access to either devs or RPMs and Flatpaks are available about everywhere, Snaps are mainly only available on Ubuntu and some Ubuntu-based distributions. And even on that, some of them are starting to remove them, like Linux Mint. And now we come to app images. This is a less well-known format, but it's still pretty cool. App images are not exactly the same as Flatpak and Snaps, since they ship the whole application in one package. They ship the binaries of the app, they ship the libraries needed, they ship the runtime. They don't reference other app images for runtimes, they don't share any components. Each app is individually self-contained. 
This means that you just have to download the file, click on it, and it's gonna open right away. No need to install stuff, no need to configure repository, no need to download some various run types. You just click on the file, it opens. You can copy it to a USB drive, put it to another computer, and it's gonna run it just the same. App images are not downloaded through a repository though. They are downloaded off of the internet or through App Image Hub, which is a website that references most of the app image files available, but they don't have a common update mechanism. You can install App Image Updater, which is a little app image that lets you update your other app images, but most of the time, if you don't know about this, each app image has to be redownloaded every time there's an update. There's no delta update, so you're downloading the whole file again. So if you have a metered connection or a limit on how much stuff you can download each month, it might not be the right solution for you. Second disadvantage is that app images also don't respect the theme you're using because they have no way of knowing which theme you're using. Each app image is independent, so there's no theming support and they all ship with a the default theme. So if you're using app images, you'll notice that they probably look out of place with your system unless you're using the default desktop theme that shipped with your desktop. For example, Advaita for GNOME. And the final main distribution format often overlooked is just the source code. Sometimes you'll find an application that is not packaged, that is not available as a flat pack, as a snap, as an app image. That's just the source code. This is often true for drivers, but it can also be true for applications that have not completely finished and that are not completely available yet as a general release, or some developers just don't want the hassle of compiling their app, making packages, or making a flat pack. So it happens. Most of these pieces of software are generally shipped in a .gz file, which is an archive format that you just have to extract somewhere and then compile the code. This can be super easy or super complex. You will need to install some packages or some applications on your distro to be able to compile it. Most of the time, though, the code ships with a readme file, which lets you know the various commands and the various library versions that you need to compile the application. This is generally not needed anymore, unless you need a very specific driver that cannot be included directly in the Linux kernel. You may never need to compile an application ever again. Some distributions, though, do tend to let you compile the code, although they do add some utilities to make it more simple. For example, Arch or Gentoo don't really have a packaging system. They have a system that will compile the package for you in the background, but it's still source code that is being downloaded and compiled thanks to various flags that have been defined at the installation of your system. You can mess around with these flags if you're super tech savvy or very technical, but most of the times you won't need to, your system will just compile the application so that it runs as best as it can on your system. And that's it for all the main software distribution formats. You've got your packages, devs are RPMs, you've got your flat packs, your snaps, your app images, and the good old source code. This is a lot of fragmentation and it can be tricky, but honestly, all formats have their advantages and their uses. I use all of them. There are no good or bad packaging formats. All of them serve a purpose, all of them have advantages or disadvantages, but in the end, what you care about is the application you want to run. If it ships as a snap, download the snap. If it ships as a flat pack, install the flat pack. You don't really need to care about how it's done. Most distributions will support all of these installation methods. If they don't out of the box, you can generally install it on most of them. So don't preoccupy yourself with how the application is distributed. Just concern yourself about what app you're gonna be using. And that's it for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, or turn on notifications. If you really did enjoy the video and you want to support what I do, I'll leave a link to my Patreon page down in the description below. Patrons get access to a monthly Patreon cast and also get to vote on the various topics I work on for next month. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!